Okay, welcome to a Chemistry 111 uh, answer key. Uh, I typically do these a lot during the course of the semester to help you not only learn uh, the correct answers for the problems, but hopefully a little bit about problem solving and maybe some approaches towards the types of questions you're more likely to find on an exam. So uh, this first one is for our quiz. Uh, the quiz was uh, you know, a good indicator of the kinds of questions that you might see on an exam. So let's dive right in and hopefully I can give you a little bit of insight into maybe some of the things that you had a hard time with or some of the things you missed. And uh, if you, you know, know some of these and you got them right, feel free to just slide along and skip ahead in the timeline there down below and uh, zoom ahead to the parts that you had a hard time with. Okay, this first one uh, was a box, right? So this is a really simple dimensional analysis warm-up question. The box is 1.25 uh, uh, cubic feet and that's really important to think about in terms of uh, you know what we're dealing with here. So I'll start my pen. Um, the idea here is that you have to be really careful to look at the units here. Uh, this is true for dimensional analysis in general, but if you start looking at things like linear or planar or uh, three-dimensional volumetric units, you have to be really careful to think what's going on here. So you got a, a volume here, and we want to convert that volume to liters, right? And you're given some uh, conversion factors here, and so we want to get to liters, and that's that's kind of... Uh, you can't really, unless you Google it, right, which you can't do on an exam, you can't go directly. And so you have to think about using some of these other conversion factors. So what I typically do is write down what I have. And I started with, what, 1.25, and I've got my cubic feet. And I'm going to go ahead and write that there. And I usually set this up uh, using dimensional analysis, which I think is really important. And so I want to get out of feet. Um, work my way towards, ah, uh, here's a nice little unit conversion. We've got milliliters and cubic centimeters, so that's a good hint. But I can't get there directly, so let's think about if we want to get to centimeters. Uh, oh, here's a conversion for centimeters to inches and inches to foot, so okay, feet, so we're going to have to work our way along. So let's go from feet to inches, which is probably the quickest way to uh, step down in terms of units. And I've got, okay, well, in this case, I've got uh, one foot, right, by definition. And so you don't need to worry about the sig figs here. That's a definition, so it's essentially infinite, is equal to 12 inches. Now, you have to be really careful here, right, because this foot, which I can probably write a little bit better as FT to put over here and match this one, that's a linear, right? 12 to 1 is linear uh, conversion, and that's not what we have. We've got a, a volumetric conversion, so we need to cube this whole thing because that way we'll be in cubic inches and cubic feet, which then would allow you to uh, distribute this in and distribute this in. So I'm going to go ahead and write that right if you do that. And then you actually have to go ahead and take 12 cubed, right? And that's really important. you got to figure that out. And so make sure you can do that on your calculator, right? Okay, we've got that done. Now if we're in cubic inches, we want to go to cubic centimeters but again we're only given this linear conversion so let's go ahead and put our our one inch here and 2.54 centimeters and just like we did before we want to convert that into the cubic quantity so we'll cube that whole thing and then that'll get us into cubic centimeters it'll allow us to cancel out the uh, cubic inches quite easily the same way we uh, cancel out the cubic feet here and then finally we're into uh, what we've got a uh, one cubic centimeter, which in this case is an approximation. So let's go ahead and actually write those down. And then 1.00 uh, milliliters. And we're almost there. Now we're in a volume unit. So now we can say then that what? We have 1,000 by definition. 1,000 milliliters is equal to 1 liter. And if you crank all this out and you get your your uh, exponents correct, I ended up getting something like 35.4 liters, which is actually quite a, a fair amount of, of, of liquid if you think about it, or gas, or whatever you have in the volume of this box. Uh, so 35.4, and I ended up uh, using three sig figs because if you look here, three sig figs, uh, three sig figs, and again, these other ones are definitions, so we don't need to worry about them, but we're given these values here plus more importantly you look and you see our initial value is given to you in, in three sig figs so um, I don't see anything smaller than three sig figs so we're safe with three so there you go and just a note on on problem solving this is what I'm going to expect to see on an exam right to get full credit 
You've got to show all the units along the way in your calculation. You've got to show the numbers, the, the units. You, you need to show some kind of approach. You can't just pop out a, a final answer and hope to get a uh, correct uh, full credit value on an exam. You've got to be able to show me everything. Show me the effort. Show me the units. Show me what you've done, and, and that'll, that'll get you through. And again here, just one last note. You want to have correct sig figs, and I would argue even more importantly, you better have a unit on any final answer and, and do me a favor go ahead and square put a box around or circle your final answer so I know what to look for sometimes you'll have a big mess of work and it might be hard for me to see it so don't let me miss something that will get you full credit so circle that final answer make sure you've got sig figs and units and you'll be all set alright the next one is pretty uh, easy little problem here just dealt with uh, some history that we talked about and so we'll go through these, through these very quickly uh, if you remember we had uh, Redken, uh, who gets credit for discovering X-rays, first Nobel Prize, uh, naturally occurring radioactivity. That was uh, Mr. Monsieur Bacquerel, and then uh, we had the three types of radiation. Well, I hope you remember Rutherford's big experiment, and hopefully you can talk about that. So that's really important. And then finally, the discovery of polonium and radium are the Team Curie here, right? So that was that was B. So hopefully you got those. Um, down and again you know this wasn't I hope too hard I mean you should know a little bit about some of the really important accomplishments that have contributed to our discussions in class again I'm not going to quiz you on the dates but you do need to know some of the main uh, contributions this next one I hope is pretty easy for you uh, just a review of our nuclear unit and so here we have this isotope of iridium this is iridium 192 it contains how many protons, right? Protons, of course, are the positive charged uh, nucleons, and they determine essentially what? The atomic number, the identity. And if you go on your periodic table, which you'll always be given, uh, I think I can find it, and it's 77 uh, protons. And if you want to find the neutrons, right? Neutrons have no charge, they're neutral. And so you take the mass number here, the 192 minus the atomic number, number of protons. What's left, therefore, are neutrons, and I think I get 115. So there you go. This is, it, this is told that it will undergo a beta decay. And so remember, a beta particle is um, essentially a high, high energy electron. And so you can see this, and it's just a matter of simply balancing. You know here that you're going to have to get. Uh, you know 77 on this side so 78 I believe plus negative 1 which tells you what element you're dealing with and I think that gives us our one of my favorite elements platinum and then finally the isotope is since that's a zero that would be a 192 so that'd be platinum 192 pretty cool and then the half-life you know this is something very similar to your lab data right you could have taken the slope and plugged it into an equation and done a lot of mathematics and that's really cool you will do that later but I would argue if I look at this just by definition of the half-life right if I've got a hundred percent right hopefully you can't have more than hundred percent but the definition of half-life is the amount of time and here's our axis here with time and days so you have a unit and if I want to go from a hundred half of a hundred is fifty and so we can say there's fifty on this plot and we can come across and look at that it's essentially right here you just go down then ooh can't draw today sorry but if you look right there I'd say that's about seventy five days so just by um, estimation you can solve this problem and you can say well that's about seventy five days and if, you, if you're worried about you know you can put a little squiggle there or if you want to I mean you could probably estimate you know and say oh well it's about yeah and it's about 75 or 77 something like that but anyway main thing you have here is an estimation a number and a unit make sure don't forget those units and you're all set all right onto the back page uh, some of you had a little bit more difficulty on this one and um, I think we can clear up that that confusion perhaps and uh, here you have what? Uh, you've got the belt of stability, which we've talked about in class, and here you have americium, and in this case, right, this is americium 243. So I would go ahead and, if it were me, uh, I would write uh, americium up here, and then I'd go on the periodic table, and I can find the atomic number, which is 95. So that will allow me to determine number of protons, right? We talked about that just above on the first page, and so there's 95 protons. And if we want to find the number of neutrons, those are 
the other nucleons that make up the nucleus. So if we take the mass number, the 243 minus the 95, I think I get 148. And now we can look at this plot, right? We've got protons down here on the x-axis. And so if we have, what, 95 protons, it's, what, right about here. And then we have 148 neutrons. Wow, that's way up there. And if we kind of see where they meet, I'm going to kind of put a little mark right there. So that would be about where our isotope of americium-243 resides. And so, wow. If you look kind of at the end of the belt of stability, it's kind of, it peters out right about here. So this is way, way massive. And so the way to kick off mass and kind of come down here is by simply doing what? That's right, it's alpha decay. So alpha decay it needs to kick off, kick off a lot of mass very quickly. Uh, the nucleus is too heavy too many protons, right? Too many protons there. And with that case, when you're above, you know, basically you're above bismuth or something like that, you're just way too, too massive. You've got a lot of protons crammed into a really small nucleus. You're going to overcome a lot of those forces there, and that thing's going to be unstable, and it's when it wants to just kick off mass. And the quickest way to do that is with an alpha uh, decay. And we can write an equation for that, right? We can write americium. Uh, we can write 243, and I'm going to go ahead and write my 95 down there. Remember, this is a decay, so we're going to kick off uh, an alpha particle, right? An alpha particle, if you don't write, like to write alpha, you can write helium, right? That's a helium nucleus, right? And if we do our uh, balancing just right, I think we get uh, this guy here. It's 239, um, and if I look up that's good old 93 on the periodic table. So we're balanced, right? 2 and 93 is 95, 4 and 239 are 243, so that is balanced and that looks like a nice alpha decay. Alpha decay. There you go. And the last one. The last one I think was the most challenging for many of you because I don't think you did any practice problems in the book, so I would really urge you to go in the book and you know, do some of those good practice problems that they sprinkle in there. They're really good. We're looking for mass defect and binding energy. In this case, I'm just looking for the binding energy. You don't even need to divide it by per nucleon like the book has. So try to save you a little time here. And so all we got to do is we take the mass of the helium nucleus and then think about the uh, four nucleons that make that up, right? And so we can say, okay, well, let's look at delta mass, right? So delta mass equals the mass defect, right? And we can say, okay, well, we can take the helium-4 nucleus, which was given to us, and that's 4.00151 in atomic mass units. And we can uh, compare that or, frankly, just subtract it from two times, in this case, we've got protons, right? And the proton is, 1.00728 mass units. And here you say, okay, well, how do I know it's two protons? Well, it's helium, right? So there are two there. Plus, and we can put this all in a parenthetical, uh, two times uh, the number of neutrons, which in this case is 1.00866 mass units. And if we add those up and take the difference, right, we'll find our mass defect. And I think I get something like Zero. I'm going to just take the absolute value because I don't really care um, if it's positive or negative. I'm just looking for a difference. And so we have 0, 3, 7 mass units based on our um, rules for sig figs. Make sure you have your correct sig figs. We're doing addition subtraction here. Uh, multiplication sprinkled in. Now 2 is a I mean, oh, it's, it's, we have exactly two protons, exactly, right? So that has no um, bearing in our sig fig calculations. You can assume it's 2.000 infinity. Here we have, you know, five places past the decimal, five places, five places, and so we're going to have five places past the decimal. So when we do this, we only have the four sig figs. And now what we're going to do is find the binding energy, and the binding energy is quite simply uh, derived from Einstein's favorite, famous equation, right? Where it equals mc squared. Now note 
that our units of mass or sorry our units of mass are in atomic mass units we need to convert that to a kilogram because if you plug this in right remember the units are going to be kilograms times what we're going to have if we square speed of light meters squared over seconds squared which is going to give us joules a unit of energy which is really important right that's the SI unit of, of energy and so we have to do that conversion so energy is going to be equal to what well we're going to take um, our conversion factor here right we're going to take um, our, I'll just go ahead and bring down our our bind energy first bring that down and then we'll use our conversion factor so 0 0.3037 got our mass unit there and we need to convert this to um, grams I guess first because our conversion in here is in grams so we want grams to be on top and we're gonna put 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd mass units right and then of course uh, there's a thousand grams in one kilogram so if you look at that whole thing that basically lets us go from the mass units to grams and to kilograms which is really important right really important uh, if you try to just plug this in the numbers totally wrong because you have to think about what unit we're going for and here we want an energy unit and if you just leave it in mass in these atomic mass units you just come up with some kind of uh, you know name your own or make your own build a bear uh, energy unit which is not gonna fly you have to have a real energy unit that we can all agree on and so in this case you need to get to the kilogram or else you have some weird funky unit that doesn't really probably exist and then finally the speed of light which you can just uh, copy down right because this is all our our mass times the speed of light squared right so don't forget to do that and so don't forget the square that's really important and if you crank that all out you get something along the lines of 4.5 what did I get 533 three. and if you do your math right or rather your arithmetic correctly um, you get uh, joules and in this case this is the joules per what I would be okay if you leave it as joules that's fine but in this case it's joules per individual nucleus right so you could have put it as joules per helium atom or joules per nucleus and that would even be uh, much more precise but that looks like a small number right and you you should probably think well nuclear processes are, are pretty powerful well yeah but if you multiply this by Avogadro's number which we'll talk about later uh, times 10 to 23rd you're talking about like mega joules we're talking about like power a city amount if you had a whole mole of helium which is only about four grams right that's kinda crazy we'll talk more about that later but for right now make sure you can do this because this is not a uh, a terribly difficult problem and it's a problem that you should be able to do from your reading and from our discussion in class and and if you're having a hard time make sure to go uh, stop in and, and, and see me and let's talk about this I'm here to help you as always uh, we've got a review session coming up for the exam and don't forget there's the SI program and also there's always the quantitative skills center so you have lots of opportunities for that exam to get the help you need so you can you know knock it out of the park and make yourself proud and, and start that first exam off on a good foot so anyway I hope this has helped uh, take a look again uh, brush up on any confusion and, and I hope this is making sense to you all